Okay. Let's, uh... Okay, so we were talking about the elasticity last time, and how the elasticity causes our is your velocity of your wave, your sound wave is dependent upon the elasticity. Those things that are more elastic will travel much faster. The sound will travel much faster than those things that are less elastic. And it's sort of counterintuitive, but things that are stiffer are more elastic. So solids are more elastic than say a liquid or a gas. And that's just because the, the molecules or the atoms in a solid will tend to go back to their original position more quickly. And as we saw in that video, that Khan Academy video, that governs how fast your wave travels, how fast those molecules go back to their original position when they're displaced. So solids then have a, have a, are more elastic and they have a higher speed of sound. By a lot, in fact. They give some of the speeds in your book. But so for example, um, the speed of sound in in steel, or no, let's do air first. The speed of sound in air is what about 300 miles an hour? What is it? Um, no, 340 meters per second is the speed of sound. You don't need to know these numbers. I'm just giving them to you for a little perspective. And this is about 760 miles per hour. So when you hear about people breaking the speed of sound, they're going faster than 760 miles per hour is quite a feat. We'll see that in just a bit. Uh, and then in water, as you would expect, because it's more elastic, we have a higher speed, 1,500 meters per second, which is equivalent to 3,400 miles per hour. And then in steel, so we're looking at about a factor of five jump from air to water. And then for steel, we have 5,100 meters, meters per second which is approximately uh, 11,400 miles per hour. Again, you don't need to know these numbers, but you do need to know that in solids, the, the sound travels more quickly because the elasticity is so much different. Um, in a gas, you can change the medium. You can change the medium to, uh, to alter the speed of sound, or to change the speed of sound. So, for example, they mentioned this in that Khan Academy video. I know it wasn't a terribly enthralling video, but it had a lot of good information in it. A uh, number of ways if you change a gas, I'll write this down in just a second, but what are some ways if you change the gas it will alter the speed of sound in the gas? You can change the temperature. The what now? Yeah, you can change the density, right? So, or maybe the mass density of it. So you can change the density of the gas. Put in different types of gas, and that will change the uh, speed at which it travels. Uh, you can also travel, or you can change the humidity of the gas. There are a number of different things that you can change. Let's just write those down. Let's see, we had a. Uh, Temperature, you can change the type of gas, like Mariah said. So for example, uh, maybe helium versus a nitrogen and oxygen. It'll travel faster in the helium gas than it will in the nitrogen oxygen blend. You can change the type of gas. You can also change the humidity, um, the pressure. The so travel or uh, sound will travel at a greater speed at atmospheric pressure than it will, say, at some higher elevation where the pressure is not so great. All right, so you can change those physical properties of the gas to change the, uh, the speed of sound in that gas. Go down from here. All right, going down. Um, 
You've probably heard of breaking the sound barrier. They talk about this in your book a bit. This was first done back in 1947, and it's been done a number of times since. We'll watch a video of the guy breaking the sound barrier. It was done by uh, Chuck Yeager in 1947. Uh, that was in an aircraft, but later it was done on a, in a land vehicle. I'll show you a video of that. Remember, this is 700 miles an hour they have to achieve in order to break the sound barrier to actually go faster than the speed of sound. In 1997, this was done by a jet-powered car. Just like Batman has, right? Batman has, doesn't it a jet-powered car that Batman has? I think it is jet-powered. But, uh... This was done in an actual jet-powered car. And they actually exceeded the 700 miles an hour. Uh, when you do this, and I'll watch a video that will, we'll watch a video that will sort of elaborate on this a bit, but you get a boom, right? The loud boom when an aircraft exceeds the speed of sound. This boom is similar, the sonic boom. is similar to the wake of a boat. Right, if I have a boat that's traveling through some water with a certain speed, it has a wake that comes off the back of the boat and waves that will travel in the water as the boat goes past. But there's a certain speed that the waves will travel in that medium because water is a medium just like any other medium. And so the waves will tend to travel at the same speed when they go through the medium. So there is a particular speed for these waves to travel. And what happens when the boat exceeds the speed of the waves is these waves tend to, to bunch up together. So when V, the speed of the boat, exceeds the speed of sound, V of the boat is bigger than V of the sound, the speed of the sound. The waves tend to bunch up or tend to overlap. And what happens is, is you get this phenomenon where you have two waves that add up. You have one wave here, and then you have another wave here, and these will add up, and they'll create a wave that has a much bigger amplitude. So whereas usually if your boat is traveling at a slower speed, these waves are spaced out. If it's traveling at a faster speed, these waves will all bunch up together like that. Right? This isn't in your book, but this particular property of waves, which we'll see later, is called interference. And it's a property of waves that when I have two waves that come together, uh, they can add up such that this happens. Actually, no, we've seen interference, right? We saw it in the previous chapter. Remember the noise-canceling headphones? You remember the noise-canceling headphones? Didn't we do that in this class? Okay, hold on. Let me look back. Maybe we didn't. I could have sworn we did. Maybe that was my other class. Okay, no, I guess we're going to get to that soon, so I'm sorry. But uh, interference occurs when you have two waves that add up together, and your peaks and your peaks add up, and your troughs and your troughs. Oh, those are my middle school teachers. I'm sorry, that wasn't y'all. That workshop that we did. All right, so I want to show you a little video. This is a, a video of um, killer whales. It's from that series called Frozen. Not like the movie Frozen, but the National Geographic series. I think it's called Frozen. It's a documentary about life at the poles and life in very extreme cold scenarios. If you're an animal lover, this is kind of a sad video, so I don't want to, if that upsets you, then let me just tell you what happens in the end. Like the seal, he's toast. He's gone. But these killer whales have a very interesting way of hunting seals, where they, they use their motions in concert to create waves that will add up 
so that when I add up my peaks to my peaks, I'll get really high amplitude waves. And they use this property of interference to, uh, to hunt for animals. So let's watch it. It's fairly interesting. Okay. I, it's just instinctual for them. They don't know anything about the interference of waves, but that, that is what they're doing. So when the three killer whales, when they're going through the water all together, they're adding up their waves, causing this interference. This is called constructive interference, uh, causing the, uh, the wave that they produce to be really large. All right, we're going to see interference again. We will talk about noise-canceling headphones and how they work using this principle of interference uh, later when we get to that. Okay. Um, All right, let's, well actually, we'll watch this video on the sonic boom, too. All right, so there's lots of different physical phenomena that can occur. He talked about how, first of all, he mentioned that the speed of the, the, uh, the air that travels over the aircraft can actually increase. That goes back to our Bernoulli's principle when we talked about the aircraft wing, how you have a flat portion on the bottom and a curved portion over the top, and the air actually travels at a greater speed across the top. That's what he was talking about there. And then also that your pressure and your density can change as well as your airspeed increases. So just different physical phenomena that can occur. Uh, it mentions this in your book as well. But the main idea here is that when you, when you exceed the speed of sound in a medium, that those waves will, sort of, will tend to overlap or, or bunch up and, and interfere in this way. All right, uh, let's do a few questions. Oh, it's OK. That's okay. Don't sweat it. Let's see. I think we did this one, right? Yeah. Yeah, let's try this one. So strings A and B have the same length and tension. Uh, string A has more mass. When plucked, how do their frequencies compare? Think back on how the, uh, the frequency depends upon those variables. I'll give you that equation right here. It's in your notes, though. It's the 1 over 2 pi square root of t over mu. So how do their frequencies compare strings A and B? Just a few more seconds. I'll stop at 50. Stopping at 50. Okay, well, let's see. So uh, if string A has more mass, that means that the mass density goes up because they, uh, they have the same length. And so the mass density of string A is bigger. It's just a bigger string. There's more mass per unit length. So if that goes up, that means this goes down. So the frequency of A is going to be less than the frequency of B. So A is right. Which medium is the most elastic, solid, liquid, or a gas? I think we had a similar question in class last time, or maybe the same question. All right, I'll stop at uh, 20. Awesome, A is right. So a pony walks into a bar, and he says to the bartender, excuse me, can I have a drink? And the bartender says, what? And the pony says, give me a drink. And the bartender says, what? And then the pony says, oh, you have to forgive me. I'm just a little horse. It is the solid is the most elastic because those molecules or atoms tend to go back. You get horse like H O A R S E. It's a pun. Are you serious? Okay, knock knock. Interrupting pirate. Arg. Don't remember that one out of you. Um, which of these media does sound travel fastest?
All right, I'll stop at uh, 20. Oh, awesome. Let's see is right. Steel travels fastest because it's the most elastic. Uh, can I hold off for just a second? Because you're going to use it for my jerks. All right, so the sonic boom is due to what? What is the sonic uh, boom? What causes a sonic boom? Stop at 40. Okay, awesome. A is the right answer. The velocity of the object is more than the velocity of the wave. It travels faster than the velocity of the wave in whatever medium. And that velocity of the wave can be different from medium to medium. All right, I think we'll come back to these later. Yeah, we're going to get into biological applications. Uh, one more thing is the production of sound. Uh, sound is produced by some object that pushes on the air. Like in that Khan Academy video, which I know is really dry, but it had a lot of really good stuff in it. I'm at it had a, a picture of a speaker. A speaker sort of looks like this. It's a paper or some flexible material that's cone-shaped. The cone shape is really just to help funnel the sound or direct the sound in a particular direction. And then it usually has a magnet behind it, some sort of electromagnet. And what that electromagnet does is it takes an electrical signal and converts it into vibrations in this paper cone or some flexible material. You ever look at your speakers in your car or speakers in your stereo, you can see on the back there's a magnet uh, that causes that paper cone to move back and forth. And you can actually see it vibrating back and forth, especially for very low frequency sounds, like bass sounds, because it moves at a very slow rate for that low frequency sound. Uh, the rate at which it vibrates is, it gives the frequency of the tone. So the cone vibrates at a particular frequency. When it does that, it causes compressions in the air. So you get condensations and rarefactions in the air. So when it pushes out, you get a, an area of high pressure because it's literally pushing that air together. And when it pulls back, you get a rarefaction. Remember, we call these condensations and rarefactions. The condensations are areas of high pressure. And the rarefactions are areas of low pressure. So that's how we produce sound. It actually turns out the detection of sound is very similar. It's just the reverse of that. But we'll get into that in just a second. You can have simple sounds, which aren't very common, but I'll show you one. And then you can also have more complex sounds. And that goes back to our interference. Now, again, your book doesn't really talk about interference. I'm pretty sure it doesn't. But I, I do want you to know about interference, that when you add up two waves, it causes a new wave. All right, we saw that with the, the killer whales. That was called constructive interference. Just know that it's interference of waves, adding up of waves. Uh, we can also get it with more complex sounds. May I move down from this page? Yeah? OK. So if I have a simple sound, just a single tone, that single tone, if I plot the uh, the displacement, or if I plot, say, the pressure versus time, or the pressure even versus distance, 
I'll have areas of high pressure, areas of low pressure, high pressure, low pressure. So this is still a compressional wave, but I can represent it as a transverse wave. This just gives our pressure, high pressure, low pressure, high pressure, low pressure. And then the same thing applies to how we dealt with transverse waves. If they're all squished up together, that's a high frequency. If they're all spread out, that's a low frequency wave. Okay, so this is a sound wave, but it looks like a transverse wave. But remember, sound waves are actually compressional or longitudinal. But these just represent the pressure, high pressure, low pressure of this compressional or longitudinal wave. However, there aren't many single tones. Let me play a single tone for you. If you go on the internet, uh, just Google tone generator or frequency generator. I have one that I like. Let me find it. Uh, LTSC. Five, seven. So this is a tone generator. And it just allows you to create a tone of a particular frequency. So let's turn this down just a little bit. So I can change the frequency. I can have a lower frequency, higher frequency, lower frequency, higher frequency. Let's stop that. Now, we can also get more complicated tones, which is like our voice, music. Those tones are very complex because you have a whole bunch of different sounds of different frequencies that are coming together. And just like with the whales, the killer whales, you remember with them, what we had is we had two waves that added up. And we got a wave with a really big amplitude. It, they interfered with one another. When I get different waves of different frequencies, and say I add these up, then I get something that looks even funkier. I get like this funky thing that looks like that. When I add up waves of different frequencies, say a low frequency with a high frequency, then I get some combination of it. And that might look something like this. I have two tones. I'll come back to that in just a second. I want to just play this tone for you. So let's open up two of these tone generators. And let's see, we'll put this one at 440. Is that annoying, that sound? Yeah, I'll take it down a little bit. Is that less annoying? A little bit. All right, so that was at 155. So let's go. I can do this one at 155 as well. All right, so now I just have two tones. But now watch what happens when I change the frequency. All right, so that's what is, what's occurring there is you're getting a, a wave that looks like this, where I have this sort of overarching tone mixed in with this other tone. Let's try to make it even a lot more different. You can hear sort of the higher frequency sound and the lower frequency sound. There are different fluctuations that are going on in that tone. And then I can add an even third tone. Remember, these are three individual tones. And they're all interacting with one another. Now, this isn't the computer is doing this. These are the actual sound waves. When they enter into the room, they interact with one another. So the computer isn't doing this. It's just in the, in the air. These, inter these uh, different waves are interacting and giving us a signal that isn't simple at all, but instead looks more like a signal like this, where I'm adding up two waves of different frequencies, and it causes them to create a more complex wave. Now, again, our voices have more, a whole lot more than just two or three frequencies all mixed in together. And music, of course, has a whole lot more frequencies than just two or three frequencies mixed together. So those, those waveforms will look even a lot more complicated than this. Um, you guys ever tuned a piano or tuned a guitar? No? Yeah? Well, if you have two strings and you want to make them the same tone, you pluck them both at the same time and you listen for what we call beats. Let me, let me show you. Um, go back to our tone generator. Find a sufficiently not annoying tone. 
I'll make them both play at the same time. Let's see, what do we have? 111. Alright, so I have two tones that are both playing at the same time. You can't tell the difference because they're exactly the same. But notice if I just go one frequency off, one hertz off, then you start to get what we call beats. And so if you're tuning a guitar or a piano, you have one thing that you know the, the, uh, the frequency of, like a tuning fork or whatever. You go, dung, and then you pluck the string on your piano or you pluck the string on your guitar. And then you compare it to, you listen for these beats. And if you have two different frequencies, you hear beats. If they're faster beats, that means you have a greater difference in the frequency of your pitches. Right, there's a, fre a frequency different of 5 hertz. And so you actually get five beats per second. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. All right, if you just have one hertz difference, 112 and 111, you get one beat per second. One, two, three, four. You hear the beat. So that's how you tune a musical instrument, in particular a, um, a stringed instrument, is that you compare the frequency of of the strain as you pluck it to a, a frequency of something that you know the frequency of, like a tuning fork or something that you generate the tone with. Or with a guitar, you tune one string, and then you use it to tune all the other strings. All right, we'll come back to this. There's some pretty cool stuff that you can do with a tone generator. Now, but first, let's look at the detection of sound. Uh, with a speaker, as we said, we have a paper cone. There's a magnet on the back, an electromagnet, and it, this speaker moves back and forth, back and forth. So this is a speaker. A microphone is exactly the same. So a microphone, instead of actually creating the compressional waves, with a microphone, you have somebody over here, and they're talking, and they're sending out compressional waves that go into the microphone and they cause that microphone, the cone in the microphone, to move back and forth. And then that is then translated into a signal. So this is a microphone as well. It works just like a speaker, but in reverse. So whereas the speaker causes the cone to move back and forth and create these compressions that then propagate outward, the microphone, instead, you have a person here speaking, and they create compressions in the medium and that travels to the microphone, causes the cone to move back and forth at a certain frequency, depending upon the tone of your sound, and that generates an electric signal, which goes into your uh, computer or your recorder or whatever. So a microphone works exactly the same way. All right, let's look at human. So we're moving now into the second part of the chapter, the human production and detection of sound or the biological applications. We'll look at uh, your vocal cords and how they work. We'll also look at the ear and how it works both in uh, as a microphone but then also an electrical signal that it sends to your brain. Um, but first of all, we have a frequency spectrum that humans can hear over. It's not the same for every human, but it's pretty close. There's a picture of it in your book. But it goes from about 20 hertz to about 20,000 hertz. That you can hear sounds down to 20 hertz up to 20,000 hertz. Now, if you have bad hearing, then you can't hear all these frequencies. In fact, some people have particular frequencies that they can't hear within the, the frequency spectrum because of various issues that they have in hearing loss and what have you. And then also, just as you get older, uh, you tend to lose the breadth of your frequency spectrum. Let's see how you guys fall on this. This is really annoying, okay? I'll try not to have it too loud, but the, especially the high end of the frequency spectrum can be kind of piercing. So I'll try to have it kind of low. We'll do the low end first. Y'all can hear that, right? Can you hear that? Okay, so how many of you can't hear it? Or how many of you can hear it, rather? Like right, three of you. All right, let's go up. I can hear that, so certainly y'all can hear it, right? So about 73 hertz. 
Hear that? Let me turn it up a little bit. It's because Shelby is like a heavy metal fan, and she's been to too many heavy metal. I can definitely hear that. Can you guys hear that? Sometimes people can just feel the pressure. It's all the way loud. I can't make it any louder. So it's a pretty high volume but low frequency sound. You can sort of hear that. You guys hear that? Okay. I think that's sort of our limit. So you say 20 hertz is a bit of a, a far stretch, but some people can actually hear all the way down to 20 hertz. Let's see if we got anybody. Anybody? Can you feel the pressure? Like if you, if you sort of stop, close your eyes, you might not be able to feel the pressure, but you might just sort of sense that something's there. Everybody be quiet. Make it out maybe, I don't know. A lot of people can hear it. Um, let's try the, huh? Mm -hmm. Let's try the higher frequency. This is kind of annoying. Let's hear that. Okay, this is 20,000 hertz. A lot of people can, can you guys hear this? Nobody can hear it? No, I can't hear it. I'll turn it up a little bit. Hear that? Anybody? Does that hurt? Does it hurt you? Let's just try. Anybody? I know you yeah, take one. Not after today, right? Oh, we're in the, okay, sorry. All right. <laughs> so next time, you can do this on your phone. Just look for a tone generator on your phone. We have a really good sound system in this room, so it won't work as well on your phone, but you can try it uh, if you, in your car, on your computer, or whatever, and uh, see sort of where your friends fall. And again, some people actually have missing frequencies, so they can't hear particular frequencies within that 20 to 20,000 hertz. But everybody has a limit between 20 and 20,000. All right? Yeah, that's what this is. So it's just a really high frequency. Because as you get older, you miss, you lose some of those frequencies. You especially lose the higher frequency. That's what it is. It's like a dog whistle too, right? Dogs can hear higher than the 20,000 hertz. So a dog whistle is, that's why you can't hear it, because it's above the 20,000 threshold. Okay? You do need to know those numbers between 20 and 20,000 hertz. Just understand what it means that, you know, that's our threshold for... For most humans, as you get older, also you tend to lose that. Or if you have hearing damage. I used to play in a heavy metal band, and so I, my hearing is not so great. And so my, my uh, frequency threshold is a little lower. Okay. Um, me and Shelby, apparently. You played in a heavy metal band, Shelby? Oh, you listened to one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, where was I? So... Frequency spectrum. Oh, so below this lower limit, below 20 hertz, we call this the uh, the infrasonic. Right, and then you have that that we can hear, the 20 to 20,000 hertz, and then above the 20,000, we have the ultrasonic. like dog whistles, for example, or ultrasonic. Um, ultrasounds or ultrasonic, they use an ultrasonic signal in order to do, uh, to do ultrasounds. We'll talk about that. Animals also are known to communicate by the infrasonic frequencies. Uh, 
uh, primarily I think the big uh, marine mammals, whales and stuff like that, communicate by that infrasonic. I remember as a kid getting National Geographic and it had the, the record in it. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Y'all ever get the National Geographic with the record of the whales? Ooh. You can play it on your record player. Ooh. You can probably find it on YouTube now. But anyway, animals sometimes communicate with these infrasonic frequencies. All right, let's look at speech production. Can I go down from here? So we're going to look at the anatomy and physiology of speech production. Uh, speech is caused by air moving past the vocal cords. It's created. And of course, this air is forced past the vocal cords because of the diaphragm. Uh, so the air is forced by the diaphragm. We talked about that, how your, your lungs aren't really muscles. They're just sort of bags sitting inside your chest. And your diaphragm pushes on them, causes their volume to decrease, the pressure to increase, which forces that air out of your, out of your uh, body. And it, it goes through your vocal cords. Uh, we air moves from the lungs. So the air goes from the lungs. It'll go to, through the trachea. It's called the windpipe. Uh, and then to the larynx. And inside the larynx, we have the vocal cords. I'll show you a picture of the larynx. And there's a picture in your book. And you guys probably covered this in anatomy, right? Speech production a little bit. Yeah. Um, this is also called the Adam's apple. So it's this thing right on your throat. Your, your uh, larynx or your voice box, your vocal cords. And then it just goes out. Let me show you a picture. You need to be able to identify these things. It's in your book. Uh, yeah, I think is this. I think this is the picture from your book. So you just need to be able to identify these things. The lungs, of course. The trachea. Uh, there's your Adam's apple. Don't worry about the cartilage. But this whole thing right here is called the larynx. And inside that larynx are your vocal cords. Just like on the last test, make sure that you can identify those things. You'll also need to know the ear, parts of the ear. So the larynx acts to protect the vocal cords. And these vocal cords are actually muscles. that can uh, move together or move apart. The Vocal cords can also change their tension. And if you remember, the frequency is given by this expression, 1 over 2L, T over mu. I think that's right. Yeah, 1 over 2L, T over mu. So the vocal cords can change the tension in your voice, or the tension, rather. The vocal cords can change their tension, and then that's what actually causes a change in the frequency of your voice. And then also, as we mentioned before, I think we mentioned this, the length of your vocal cords 
will also affect your frequency. And so men typically, who are typically bigger than women, men tend to have longer vocal cords. And as you know, if I make L get big, that means that the frequency decreases. And that's why men tend to have lower voices than women, because they, they have a longer vocal cord. And so this comes into play. If I have a longer vocal cord, then I tend to have overall a lower frequency. The tension, on the other hand, I change myself. So I can go low or I can go high. And you can change your frequency based on the tension of your vocal cords. They're muscles. They can get tight or they can be loose. Um, you also have what's called a glottis. And the glottis is just the area between the vocal cords. The space between the vocal cords. If you're whispering or you're breathing, then the glottis is open. And if you're talking, then the glottis will open and close as you're talking. So whispering or breathing, that glottis is open. There's something called a glottal stop. You all familiar with this? Any singers in the room? You know what a glottal stop is? I'll show you a video about what a glottal stop is. But it's a, a thing in music is when you close the glottis. And this causes a particular sound. Oops, sorry about that. Singers use this. I have a video I want to show you about the glottal stop. So, I'll just I'll get it. Right. Um. All right, so a couple more things. The amplitude of your sound. Remember amplitude for a sound wave? That is, uh, what is that proportional to? When I talk about the amplitude of a sound wave, I'm talking about the, the loudness or the volume, yeah. So the amplitude is related to the loudness or the volume. Um, and the way that we govern the volume of our voices is by the amount of air that goes past our vocal cords. So the amplitude is... Um, is governed by the amount of air that flows past the cords. I'm taking this class. I'm working on an MDiv. I told y'all. I'm taking this class on preaching. And they talk a lot about... Uh, sort of care for your vocal cords. Because if you're addressing a large group of people a lot, you know, like preachers in the past, there was this guy back who would, would address tens of thousands of people, like 30,000 people all in a crowd with no amplification system. Can you imagine that? I know, it's amazing. Like uh, George Whitehead, Whited, Whitehead, he would do that. Uh, but anyway, you have to really, when you're speaking, you have to really use your diaphragm a lot to help force that air up through your vocal cords so that you don't damage your vocal cords. But instead, you're really working with your lungs, forcing that air to produce the volume uh, from your lungs and, and that the amount of air that's flowing past the cords, your vocal cords. Uh, the Bernoulli effect is also apparent in our vocal cords. Remember the Bernoulli effect? We had this a little bit. In the last chapter, Bernoulli effect has lots of implications, but when the speed goes up, the pressure goes down. That was really the main implication. And that we saw that with aircraft wings, remember? Where if I had an airplane wing, the air travels over this longer distance with a greater speed. 
So up here, V goes up, so the pressure goes down. And because I have a low pressure, that means I have overall lift because I have a higher pressure on the bottom and I get lift on an airplane wing. That's why your airplane wings are always shaped, curved on the top, flat on the bottom, and not the other way around because then you'll just you go down. Uh, but the Bernoulli effect, we also see that in our vocal cords. Muscles bring the cords together. Or actually, you know, the cords are muscles, so they, they bring themselves together. And then air flowing past them. forces them apart. Uh, pushes the cords apart. And so you have this high velocity air going through the vocal cords. Because I have a high velocity air, the pressure between the vocal cords is what? Big or small? I have a small, a small uh, pressure in between the vocal cords which causes them to tend to come back together again. So this high velocity air causes a low pressure between the vocal cords. this causes, so I have air push forcing them apart, and then they come back together, they force apart, they come back together. And so, because I have this back and forth, the vocal cords vibrate. I have the air forcing them apart, I get this low pressure, so they tend to come back together, but then more air comes and forces them apart again, and so they vibrate back and forth which is what we get when we have like a vibrating string, like on a guitar. The same thing occurs with your vocal cords as they move back and forth, and they actually produce that sound that comes out of your mouth. All right, let's see, I have here that I can do this. I forget how this works, so. Um, show how to print it. Uh, this isn't a great demo, but let me show you. You can just take a sheet of paper, and if you blow air around either side, you can produce sound. You can try it later on your own. Oh, it's on the microphone. Did y'all hear the sound? And notice that if I make the, the paper tighter, so there I had the, the paper pretty tight. I'm going to pull it really, I had it pretty loose right there so it could vibrate. If I pull it tight, if I make the tension in the paper tighter, I increase that tension, what should happen to the frequency? Let's go out. Let's see if it works. Yeah, that sort of worked, right? It was a higher frequency. You can try that with paper later if you just take a single sheet of paper and you can blow air around it. Uh, it's not quite the Bernoulli's principle, but you get that idea that the tension increases. Okay, guys. Sorry. Y'all have a good day. All right. That clock is slow. My watch. Is it 10, 18? Yeah, we'll call it a day anyway. Y'all have a good day.